creates his own offensive chance with that motor. Krejci to Coyle! And the Leafs are moved again! Hey there. Welcome to the Nesson Bruins podcast. I'm Nesson.com's Mike Cole, joined, as always, by Nesson.com's Logan Mullen. Logan, how are you? Good, Mike. How are you? Not bad. Are you... Uh... Uh, you were you on the move recently? It seems like uh, yeah, Re- left Connecticut on uh, Tuesday. Yeah, Today is Wednesday morning, and I am back in my apartment in Boston. Far less space, but uh, a little bit more familiar. I, I like to think I don't know what your reasons are, but I like to think that this is a sign that it, you know you have some sort of uh, tell or uh, information or something. This Looking is Looking into the future. Yeah, we're getting closer towards uh, <laughs> normalcy. But, no, there uh, there were logistical reasons that I needed to be back here. Uh, whatever. I like my that are independent of me. Yeah, I like my reasoning better though. Let's just assume that this is uh, a sign that we're return- returning toward normal. That's yeah. uh, that's the, the, the and what line. what better way to do that than by talking about 2011? Yeah, exactly. So that's uh we are gonna. Uh, Zoom calls about the 2011 Bruins are all the rage right now, so we're going to do our own today. Uh, I think ours is going to be a little more, uh, a little safer for work than the, the 2011 Bruins reunion was uh, on, the, on their YouTube page Tuesday night as they watched along with Game 7 of the 11 Cup Final on Nesson. Uh, we will get into that momentarily. Before we do, though, let's just uh, – a quick update on where things stand with the 2020 NHL season. Uh, the new info is that there really is no info. Um, this feels like the first week in a while that there hasn't been any sort of update really one way or another. Um, and I'm not sure if that's good or bad news. Uh, I guess it's just, it is what it is at this point. We're all kind of just waiting this thing out and hoping that, uh, you know, we get some good news, you know, in some regard. Um, I guess, you know, you brought this up as we were about to come on the, uh, the governor of, uh, New Hampshire, Chris Sununu said on WEI last week that Manchester is very open or New Hampshire in general is very open to hosting some sort of hockey at some point this year. He said that they've had talks with the NHL. He said he can't say much more. And then he continued to kind of tip his hand about that. Uh, It sounds like New Hampshire and the NHL are talking. Uh, New Hampshire is very much open to hosting hockey games at some point if they do return this year uh, without fans. And it sounds like, they're not alone so I think the most likely option right now is we're gonna have what like regionals kind of like the frozen yeah. four or the final four where there might be you know the New Hampshire regional and the North Dakota regional and you know in places where maybe uh coronavirus hasn't really decimated the area or places where there's multiple ranks with hotels so I guess the fact that they're continuing to have those conversations can be seen as a good thing I don't know other than that yeah. there's not a lot to yeah, it just reaffirms kind of what we've already known, which is the league is hell-bent on not necessarily finishing the regular season, but trying to finish at least the 2019-20 season in some form or fashion, and that they're willing to go to essentially any lengths possible to do that. And, I mean, Chris Anunu just outright admitted that, right? You know, yeah. that, that's not just – I don't know if anyone's necessarily smoke screening anything right now, but it's not just – something to get fans worked up about like there's there's legs to some of the rumors uh i will say too uh some guy named wayne gretzky said that he believes uh there will be hockey again this year which again might be wishful thinking at this point lou lamorello said the same thing too. right yeah which is weird though because like they all have either directly or indirectly pretty strong (laughs) investments yeah yeah you know (laughs) yeah i i agree too I, i don't know um, I had one other tidbit. Oh, the uh, the draft. I thought this was interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pierre LeBron, I think it was, uh, reported the draft could still happen in June mm-hmm. virtually while the playoffs might be going on at the same time, which yeah. is weird. At this point, like, the draft might precede the playoffs, which would be – Yeah, it very well could. Uh, but that's definitely – I think that's a, a certainty no matter when they do it that that's going to be virtual i would yeah i would suspect that they're going to be watching very closely exactly. what happens this weekend yep. with the nfl and as long as it looks like some semblance of a decent product and that there aren't you know abject failures technologically that that's probably the avenue they'll pursue uh, at least in the uh, where we get dicey is at least in the nfl's case they were able to have the combine right yeah, like right. with a lot of these guys in the nhl draft you're probably going 
in a sense, sight unseen, right? It's, like, it's, like they've scouted those guys. They have film on it. They're not yeah. complete unknowns, but it is different than having a combine or something to that effect. I feel like it's far more difficult to do it. That I mean, I don't know. It would be nice to maybe we can look into having finding a scout who's or somebody who was a part of this process at some point. It seems more difficult in the NHL, to be honest with you. Like, there's no. I mean, you could argue junior hockey in Canada or whatever, but like, there's really there's no SEC for hockey. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like, it's hard. I think I would imagine it's harder to find information, good film, et cetera, et cetera, or even like a representative. Uh, you know, like the film might. You know, what good does it do if a guy's averaging three points a game in like a, you know, in a junior league somewhere, or like a high school, or you know, yeah. however you want to break it down. It's a much easier to see like Davion Clowney a few years ago just <laughs> right. wrecking the SEC and be like, yeah, he's playing against other. Grown guys who are going to the NFL. Yeah, right. So I don't know. It'll be interesting. But again, with you know, with the NFL, the NHL, any sort of thing in this regard, everybody's in the same boat. So I think it's it's right. equal footing. Um, real quick, what's your uh, what's your weekly update oh, on your update. confidence scale? I think last week I went up. I think I went to a five. I think I'm back down to a four. Um, I I don't know. It's there really wasn't much to go off of this week except yeah. for the stuff we've already seen, which is like well, next person says they're encouraged it'll come back, and the NHL is keeping all their options open. I probably won't have another firm opinion until we get some sort of direction about when the league recommended self-quarantine for players and staff ends oh actually interesting one other point guys are skating in sweden oh that, right like, and a, per usual Joakim nordstrom might be more prepared than anyone else there you go uh which is an interesting like moral thing it's like the nhl told them to self-quarantine but that was a, a suggestion as you know right it was not a mandate right it was not a, mandate. Right, not a so, mandate um in terms of the scale i well, i think it was like a two and a half last week yeah uh I guess I'll stay there because I don't know how you can go up when we're one week. Right. We've burned another seven days of time. You know what I mean? So I'm going to stay there. Uh, there wasn't really any much movement, so we'll see. I'm, I'm back to my original spot. I don't know if this is where I always was. I forget. But just bag it. Like, it's not worth having this season. Just start next year on time, and let's be on our way. But We'll see. The weather, once the weather starts changing, that's when it's going to get weird. Like, yeah. it was like 34 degrees this morning. So I was like, oh, this is yeah. still hockey weather. But like, when it gets, when we're having this conversation mid May, it's going to be weird. Yeah, and it's 70 degrees out. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let's get to, to what, we're, what we're here for the main event, if you will. Uh, we'll talk about the 2011 Bruins. And we don't really have any guidelines as to what you and I are going to talk about here. We're just going to have a, a nice little yeah. free flowing conversation, reminisce about the good old days for the Boston Bruins. Um, I, I will say, I so did you watch the entire Zoom call? I caught most of it, not all. So, like, the chirps aside, whatever, I, I just think the biggest thing that I took away from this was, like, these guys are genuinely likable. And I think that, yeah. that was my biggest takeaway at the time. It, in hindsight, that remains my biggest takeaway. And, like, watching them interact again last night and kind of, reflecting on that I, like this is if you're a boston sports fan i don't know football is such a big thing around here or everywhere but like for me when i look back as a kid growing up or i mean i was actually working at nesson when the bruins won the cup that's you know how long i've been there but like uh i look at like the 11 bruins right below like the 2004 red sox in terms of teams that i, I really just enjoyed watching play yeah. and, and you know enjoyed the idea of and everything and the fact that they became the first team to win the cup in, in 40 years in Boston is, is insanity. It's just like, you see it again in the replays. It's like winning the Stanley cup is just cool as hell. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels here, but I just, that was the, that's like the big takeaway. It's just, it was a likable team that did something really special. Well, and I think in retrospect, it's easy to forget just how good they were. Yeah, like, it, like I was looking at the names on that Zoom call, and it's like Michael Ryder was playing the third line on that team, and he was like easily a top six winger on pretty much any NHL team back then. Like that fourth line, whether they had Sagan or Thornton playing, like just an absolute wagon with Gregory Campbell and Danny Paye. It's like it, they just, even as the years have gone on, it's really only further validated just how good they were. Because Brad Marchand at that time was a relative unknown. And then you're like, holy crap. 
crap. They had, you know, Brad Marchand playing with Mark Recchi and Patrice Bergeron. It's like, how do you stop that? Um, so, and, and I did find it comical too. I mean, it sounds like they don't necessarily keep an active touch, but they're in contact with one another. I mean, they got most of those guys back for the 2019 cup final to be the fan banner you guys. I think it was for game one. Yeah, um, but right, a good yeah. chunk of them were back. I mean, some of them still work in but, hockey ops. Some they, of them are still playing. You know, Chris yeah. Kelly's still in the organization. Sean Thornton works for the Panthers. Um, you know, a lot of those guys are hanging around in different places. Uh, but it was just funny how comfortable they still were with one another. Like, you know, you've got Michael Ryder chirping Thomas Caverle and, you know, guys who might not have seen each other for a long time still just, you know, riffing like they haven't missed anything. It's uh, It was a pretty interesting dynamic to watch. Yeah, it's true. Like there was, uh, it was like they hadn't missed a, a step. And like I do think it was pretty cool that they got. I'm just looking at the roster right now. Like Lucic still plays. So like, I don't know. I don't know if there's like some sort of code or something where you're not supposed to do something with your old team if you're. St- I mean, I that was you're... interesting too. But like Lucic plays still. Uh, obviously Sagan, he was there. I mean, even, like, Recky works for the Penguins, I think it is. Gregory Campbell works for uh, the Blue Jackets. Right, and yeah. Those guys haven't only just done this. Like, we've been doing the Twitter takeover things, and, like, Gregory Campbell was running the Bruins' Twitter account for a night. Milan Lucic was doing the same thing. It's like, uh, this is such a unique situation, so this is probably the time that you make exceptions, right? Like, otherwise, we probably would not be doing this, yeah. uh, you know, if there was not a global pandemic. But right. It is interesting how it's just kind of like, in some respects, just no rules. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the numbers. Do you know who led that team in points that year, regular season? Regular season, it was Recky, wasn't it? No, no, no. It was it was tied. It was Lucic and Krejci. I'm ah. just looking. At, it's nuts. 62 points led that team. I mean, sport was a little yes. bit different, but <laughs> yeah, Recky had 48 points. He was fifth. Yeah, in it league. wasn't even close. That was the crazy thing, too, is watching that 2011 – or the uh, Game 7, uh, like, Recky had that one breakaway where he got basically knocked ass over tea kettle. <laughs> but there was, like, a burst there for a guy who was 42 years old at the time. Yeah. He was still going. That guy's a hell of a hockey player, to your original point. Like, a Hall of Famer. Like, the guy yeah, was just right. – you know, I mean, I, I know he's at the end of the road, but, like, uh, it's just a tremendous hockey player. Great drinker, too, by the way. He was <laughs> – a lot true. of them were. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Like, a lot of them did well for themselves. The uh, the, the Merlot thing, not a gimmick. That, no, no. <laughs> it's a way of life for Living them, that, uh, yeah. 2011 Bruins team. So, um, I don't know. what else, uh, Just that, uh, from the actual hockey standpoint, um, I I think, you know, I was watching it last night, and you're almost not nervous, but you're like, they're at, for a second there, it's like, how are they going to do this? How are they going to go? Like, they hadn't won a game. In Vancouver, they didn't really look great at you know for good chunks of. I mean, they certainly didn't look like the Canucks did when the Canucks came to Boston. But right. like, it, you know, going back to Vancouver, you're in a tough spot there. You hadn't won there. They're, this is, this team had so much balls, like really, like well, you know, and- winning game sevens throughout that. You know, even going back to the first round, you're down two games going into Montreal in the first round, like crazy resiliency from that team. yeah it, it's easy to forget too just how good the Canucks were that year right too. and never mind the fact that they beat the Canucks but I mean they completely neutralized the Sedins like I and I know that people rib the Sedins for that nowadays but I mean they really did just I think one of the Sedin brothers didn't have a single point until I think it was game six well Henrik uh, I game, think it was because Henrik yeah. scored in game six and that was like the first point he had the entire series yeah and in game uh seven both Sedin twins were on the ice for all four goals like they just undressed two guys who were you know top what at that point top 10 players in the league yeah. um yeah and like and they bullied them too you know because they, there was the one thing where Marshawn gets on the ice. Well, I think it was right in front of the Bruins bench. And he, like, slashes Sedin. I forget what Sedin it was as he skates by. Slashes him. Like, circles back around into the uh, – setting up for the faceoff. Like, basically hip checks him. Yeah. Then, like, Sedin finally starts to slash him back a little bit. He cross checks him. Like, they just – There's the Wild Wild like, West. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. just, I think yeah. that's the other thing, too, is, like, I, I don't know if we're ever going to get – I mean, you know, Bruins Blues got pretty testy, but like 
I don't know if we're ever going to have a, a series like that again. Like, and you can no. go back, maybe like a divisional series, but even then, it's just such a different style of hockey. Even in the last ten years, like, I, I think back to like that, uh, the Canadian Senators series a few years ago. That was at least you know a divisional rival. Like, you can't. It's so hard for two teams that don't play a lot to build up that level of hate. It was awesome. Yeah. It, was awesome. It, it is funny to watch how you know it it was only nine years ago like it feels like an eternity at this in, in some yeah. senses and then in other respects it's like it really wasn't that long ago but you watch those games and you watch how much things have changed like in game three when they combined for the it was like 96 penalty minutes in the third period and you've got you know Milan Lucic spearing Alex Burrows in the nether regions and then punching him as he goes to the ground it's like that would be a very long suspension if he well, did that nowadays, like that, you want to talk about series changing dynamics. I mean, you know, look at what uh, Ivan Barbashev and Oscar Sunquist got suspended for. Like right. two guys got one game for the Blues during the most recent Stanley Cup. And it was like, if so many things that happened during that Bruins Canuck series on both sides would be suspendable if it happened nowadays. And it's very funny watching Milan Lucic and Brad Marchand, guys who play with edge like that back then, just. I don't want to say unhinged, but they, they were not tied down to some sort of fear about, you know, getting suspended or supplemental discipline or anything. It was funny. I think there was at least, I mean, there was at least one time, maybe two. I think even Chara mentioned it. It was early in that game. And I, I forget who it was. It would have, might've been glass or I don't know, Hanson. I, somebody just basically did a drive by and just smoked Chara at the blue line behind the play. And they showed replays of it. And Chara even, like, Chara didn't say anything uh, in the Zoom call. And he's like, yeah, that'd be like two games these days if that yeah. happened. Like, it was just casual. just like on with it. Um, yeah. It is, it's nuts. That other, the other thing too, watching this series, I mean, this is going to sound a completely homer, but I don't care. I mean, their, their resumes speak for themselves. That Canucks team seriously might've been like one of the most unlikable teams of all time, unless you live in British yeah. Columbia. Well, it didn't help that they had traded for Maxime Lapierre. Right. And, so they had the, a team with Max Lapierre and Rafi Torres. Is It speaks for itself. Like Right. Well, and Alex Burroughs, too. Like, Alex Burroughs, Burroughs right. always played with edge. But the problem was you had Alex Burroughs do the whole biting thing in game one. And then in game two, he scores the winner. And then in overtime, and then in game one, the winning goal with 18 seconds left was right. scored by, as you mentioned, Rafi Torres. So it's like right off the jump, there were two guys who yeah. are just known for the wrong reasons in the NHL, basically undoing the Bruins. And then you had guys too. I mean, the Sedins were wonderfully talented players, but certainly came off as borderline gutless in that series. I don't yeah. want to take shots at guys who've played thousands of NHL. What, you know what I mean? It's kind of hokey but still it was not a great look for them and he even got you know bxa kind of a punk sometimes yeah Kessler, the air and rome thing obviously air and rome, yeah guys who like you know if I, you could say the same thing if you live in 30 other nhl cities about brad marchand obviously yeah right you know well, even, it's funny too because roberto luongo has done a lot to i don't necessarily want to say repair his image yeah but like with the with the remarks about how Tim Thomas played and everything like that, like he did not make a lot of friends that year and it didn't help that he was tinkling down his leg during that entire series. But that was another guy where it's just like, he wasn't necessarily a bad person, but he would do things where he'd sit there and be like, what's the benefit? Like, what is the benefit after game five of launching these harpoons at, you know, a guy who, if the Bruins win is going to win the con Smythe, like unequivocally. It, it's nuts too. Just looking back on it. it, it was the perfect storm, like the perfect hockey storm. I don't remember nationally how big it was. I mean, clearly it wasn't on ESPN and stuff. And I don't know how much people paid attention to it. I know in Canada it was an interesting point of contention because, like, Canadian teams get to the the Cup final. It rarely happens, um, but when they do, uh, usually the entire country of Canada roots for that team. It was not the case with the Canucks, right. you know, but people were paying attention to it just like with the, the instant hate between the two teams and with all the certain, all the storylines, it, it is like, it's one of the, what, 10 best Stanley cup finals of all time. Yeah. I mean, it was, I, mean, I don't know. I'm not going to sit one. here. And- well, and you, you have to look at the context too, in terms of like, you know, it'd been almost 40 years since the Bruins had won it. The Canucks had right. never won it. 
Um, you know, it was two very good teams. Like, and, and with the Bruins too, there was an NHL legend in Mark Recchi that you all but certainly knew was going to retire. Yeah. Um, like there were just storyline after storyline that would have been fascinating to watch, even if you don't add in all the bad blood and Horton going out and all of that stuff and the, and the way Tim Thomas played, like just in terms of generic storylines, there was so much. And then the games only added to that right. in a big way. Like even game three was an absolute shellacking, but it was still an entertaining game. Yeah, Maybe exactly. not if you're a Canucks fan, but like from a pure hockey standpoint, it was you know riveting to watch not riveting to watch Nathan Horton get his clock clean, but how the Bruins responded to that and poured eight goals on. Um, so it's just it, in every regard, it was absolutely captivating. Yeah. Like if you were to sit there and try to like power rank the moments in that series, there's just so many little things that you would maybe initially forget about. Like, you know, the Burroughs biting thing obviously stands out, but it's just kind of, I don't know. And then like, the next game, you had Lucic point like putting his finger in Bros's face, trying yeah, to get him right. to bite it. But like there was that, there was like the the Thomas check in the crease. Like there's, right. you know, Marshawn that... speed bagging Sadine. Like there's just a bunch of little things like that. Honestly, if you had to put like the number one like moment or image or whatever, like if you're putting a statue of the 2011 team, yeah. out there in some, you know in some way it would have to be tim thomas leveling um yeah that's true sedina at the crease it is a good i like that like i yeah what would like what's the lasting image from that from a bruin standpoint because it's it's emblematic of the series as a whole right like it's tim thomas just having his way with a canucks player and said canucks player just so happens to be a sedine who is completely like his brother neutralized the entire series when he should have been you know in the same way that Tim Thomas was undressing the Canucks, that's what they were supposed to be doing to him. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's nuts, too. Like, the Bruins won four games in that series, and Thomas put the, the finishing touches on one of the all-time goaltending runs of any playoffs, you know, and there's not one player, one thing that stands out, one goal. It's not like they – you know, I mean, it speaks to the fact that they beat the hell out of the Canucks when they won games. So, like, it wasn't like there was a big overtime game or a huge game-turning save or something. I think that kind of speaks to that, you know, that 2011 Bruins team is that there was not a huge lasting image or moment from that series. It's just when they needed to, they got wins. And when they did, they they all kind of contributed. It was, it was pretty impressive. Yeah, well, and it's funny, too, to look back. And this is not an effort to minimize what Tim Thomas did that year but the way he played there were so many games that the Bruins didn't need him to be nearly as good as he was yeah. but he'd turn in these but, like 40 save performances and it's like they went five to one yeah and, <laughs> like, but at the same at the same time too though there was plenty of games where like uh what, game there, seven against Tampa yeah like, but that's even there, he made a couple saves in game seven early that you're like oh yeah I would you know you forget about that because the final score is four nothing Made a couple big ones. I think it was game four. It was either game four or game six. I think he made a couple big saves in the first five minutes when, like, it might have been game six because, like, the Canucks obviously came out with a, a push because you get a chance to win the Stanley Cup, you know? Right. And, and I remember, too, watching, rewatching that game, a ton of Canucks fans at the Garden that night. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, understandably so. But he made a couple saves early on that kind of almost get forgotten compared to like the Downey save or something earlier yeah. in the, or the, you know, a couple of big ones in the Montreal thing. So, um, you know, that's just, uh, yeah, it just takes, it, I think looking back and rewatching it, it gives you an understanding and appreciation of how hard it is to win a Stanley cup and like how many big moments you need to have and how many guys need to come up big at certain times to, to win a cup. Well, and that 2011 Bruins team, this stat stunned me and I just forgot that it existed was, they were the first team to win the cup after winning three game sevens. Like they were the first team that required at least three game seven. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you, you forget that like, okay, they mauled the flyers, but like there were so many points throughout that entire postseason run where it's like, they could have just been done. I mean, they go down 2-0 to the Canucks. They go down 2-0 to the Canadians. They get to, you know, a game seven yeah. against the Canadians. They get to a game seven against the Lightning. They get to a game seven against the Canucks. Like, there were so many times where 
it just if one thing goes even the slightest bit amiss, then they're done. Um, but again, very much a testament to what that team was. And and you know, David Krejci and Patrice Bergeron and Zdeno Chara, they were all you know established NHLers at that point. But you look at you know, kind of to reiterate an earlier point, Brad Marchand, Tyler Sagan, like some of those younger guys, just you didn't realize obviously how good they ultimately were going right. to become. But then you look at that team now and you're like, well, it's a shock they win 82 games that year. It's going to be funny when it's all said and done and we're going to look back at, I mean, there's going to be six or seven hall of famers out of that series, assuming both Sedins get in. I yeah. think that's their only one. Luongo? Will. Yeah. Luongo, Luongo will probably, will probably get in. But then, I mean, if you want to count, Rask in that technically he'll probably mm-hmm. get in, but like Recky, Chara, Bergeron, Marshawn's on a you know upward trajectory toward that. Like that's Sagan. Yeah, there's a lot. It's pretty cool. So. Yeah. Um, what's all right before we get out of here? What's the last? What's the? I don't know. What do you think of? What do you think of first? What will you think of first in twenty years from now when you think of the 2011 Bruins? Honestly, it would probably have to be game three of the Stanley Cup final because that one had – it had a little bit of everything, and I do think it was a an overall representation of the series. Like there was a series-altering moment with the Horton hit. Yeah. Um, you know, for a while there was still the, the finger-biting thing going on at that point. Um, that third period was very contentious, but when the dust settled, the, the Bruins, in a moment that they needed, ended up just completely steamrolling um, yeah. the Canucks. So that, even to this day, whenever I think about that series, the first thing that typically comes to mind is Game Three and how at that point everything changed. I mean, they were down two zero in the series at that point. Like it really was. They needed that game so badly, and they lost one of their best scorers minutes into the game and ultimately did not end up being overly phased by it. Yeah. I think for me, it's just a more general thing. And it's kind of speaks to what you were just saying. It's part of it. It's just every time they desperately needed a win and desperately needed to play well for a team that let's be honest, had pooped itself one year earlier and had a, you know, a bit of a reputation for choking. Yeah. Every time they got close to choking again, they turned into world beaters. It was like the resilience and the, the guts, I think, is what's going to kind of stand out. And the, the game seven stat points to that. And, you know, winning it, you know, winning that series after falling down 2-0 to Vancouver, winning the series after falling down 2-0 to Montreal and having to go up to the Bell Center. It's just – I think that type of stuff grows. The legend grows as the years go on. Well, and they really didn't get a ton of – breaks thrown their way either you know like okay a lot of guys on the Canucks clearly were playing hurt like losing the Canucks losing Dan Ham Hughes in game one hurt but like otherwise it the Bruins were playing some pretty complete teams um you know they they were missing Bergeron for the beginning of the Tampa series like yeah Dan Ham Hughes and Sean Bergenheim were probably the two like notable players that they ended up dodging and the Bergenheim thing was just because he was on a meteoric stretch during that postseason um and I will say too it's if one of the takeaways from that zoom call Tuesday night is that they somebody either I think they mentioned it on TV like the Canucks injuries a recce got passed yeah a few Bruins you know piped up real fast saying like you know, they weren't the only ones dealing with injuries. So I think there's stuff there that we, I mean, there always is, you know, Yeah, right. You, you always, there's always stuff there that, and I think it's important too, before we get out of here, like I was going to say my second thing is just Tim Thomas playing one of the best. It's like Brady esque in terms of a playoff run or David Ortiz in terms of almost you know, better in some senses, considering how, how much he played. Right. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, he, you could make, there's like a, five or six minute video reel on YouTube of like Tim Thomas, 2011 playoff highlights, which is nuts when you're considering it's what 25 games of, of footage. Like he's, he made every big save he needed to what, how many soft goals 
do you remember? A few. Other, he, other than, he started you know, slow. Time. He started slow in the Montreal series. True. Yeah. But otherwise, was. I mean, and he was making like, you know, two on one breakaway saves. Yeah. The I mean, the Downey save is sick. Like that, honestly, could be like if you want to look at a statue like moment. That's that's up there. Like just well, him diving across. It's just another he had thing no too. Is, I mean, Tuka Rask was the backup then, and he did not play a minute that postseason. Yeah. Like they never had to pull Tim Thomas, which is absurd when you consider, especially how much. We saw Corey Schneider during that yeah, series, point. and um, who was uh, oh, and Sergey Bobrovsky uh, yeah. backing up uh, Brian Elliott or Brian Boucher in yeah. Philly. Like the Bruins saw a lot of backup goalies yeah. <laughs> during that series because they were chasing the starter, and I, they chased Dwayne Rolson a couple times. I was like Tim Thomas never was phased. Like he never got himself in such a pinch that they were like, all right, we're we're gonna go to Tuca. Which, you know, also a testament to the, to the D. The, you know, I think Tuca was making jokes about that Tuesday night, saying, like, uh, another turnover right in front of you. you know, what, yeah. I don't know how you did it with these guys, but, yeah, I mean. There's one go. turnover that I'll never forget in game three. I forget who he gave it to, but Adam McQuaid had the puck at the end boards, and he didn't even look, and he just backhanded a pass. And this is in the defensive zone. He just back, blindly backhanded a pass right into the slot, and it got picked off. And unsurprisingly, and Thomas was waiting right there. And it's like, yeah. I get it that Adam McQuay was like 21 or 22 at the time, but still, it's just like complete boneheadedness sometimes that they completely got away with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Boy Chuck was young too. I think he said 24. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh, and also, real quick, I mean, Char and Seiderberg, 20 minutes a game. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it's horses, nuts. absolute yeah. work horses. Just nuts. So that's another thing too that we'll probably get forgotten. Like that's going to be a thing where people of our generation will be in a bar, assuming we ever get to go back to bars in like 25 years from now. They'd be like, let me tell you about this Dennis Seidenberg guy. Like, you know, Char gets all the credit, but. Well, every now and again, in the playoffs, you'll see some guy get run out there for like you know, 27 minutes or something yeah. like that. You'll be like, Oh my God, look at that. Uh, I mean, shoot how long did the thomas shabbat playing as much as yeah. he did stay in the news cycle and like what the oilers did with dry and mcdavid but like char and seidenberg were playing well north of 25 minutes with a good bit of regularity yep um and they weren't young either at the time no no char was what 34 and yeah seidenberg's right around there too i think he's a couple years younger he was probably back to, or he was past 30 though I think. no seidenberg was 29 he might have turned okay. 30 that year um, and then, yeah, Chara was um, – Still, I don't care who you are. That's, that's Chara was 33, 34. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. It's just – it's insane. Um, the fact that Chara is still going, too, is – Yeah, that's also weird to watch. So, all right. Um, well, this has been enjoyable. I could do this for – I honestly could do this for, like, two more hours. But... Yeah, I mean, we, we keep going. Wait, one more thing. Yeah, more I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel bad because I don't want to be done and be like, oh, man, we should have talked about, you know, so-and-so because it's just such a – it was a team effort. Was a, yeah. Um, easily the best Bruins team of my lifetime uh, so far. So, and I, you know, I've been here for a while, so. Yeah, well, here's, here's what we'll do when it's – I forget what day it was that they clinched, uh, June 15th, 15th, something like yeah. that. When it's June 15th and we still don't have any live sports, we're like, what are we going to do for a podcast? We'll, we'll take copious notes over the next we'll just, nearly two months and be like, here's what we back. forgot, and then just run it for three uninterrupted hours. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so I guess we'll be back next week. We still have – we've been teasing your interviews. Yes, we, well, those, those are happening now. So I'm going to determine the schedule off the top of my head right now next week uh jack ashan the okay. defenseman of the bruins side the college free agent from st cloud state we'll do that next week uh and then we have probably johnny beecher the 2019 first round pick the week after and then the following week would be jack becker who is a seventh round pick in 2015 i believe but like, he's also been playing at michigan he's going into his senior year so he's got one more year left with the Wolverines. So have interviews with all three of them and uh, we'll find something to talk about in the interim to lead up to those interviews. But starting next week and the next three weeks, we will have uh, some, some nice fresh stuff. Sounds good. Hopefully we'll soon be preparing to uh, preview the Stanley cup playoffs as well. Uh, maybe right up the road in, uh, in New Hampshire. Maybe I can, be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can be uh, Nissan.com's New Hampshire correspondent and just be stuck in Manchester. You do, you do live not that far from the I know, yeah. I can see it from here. I can see it from my house. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. All right. Cool. This has been the Nesson.com podcast. I'm Mike. That's Logan. We'll uh, be back again next week. Maybe, probably. Uh, until then, wash your hands and, and keep your distance, people. Uh, see you in a, see you in a week. See you. Thank you.